Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? It's okay? You hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Thank you. First of all, I uh, would like to thank Stanislas for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, in this school. So, uh, the first lecture I will give, it's about daily neutrons, but just before beginning, I will give you a few words about my, uh, my CV. I made my PhD at... Uh, uh, oh. Okay, 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 thank you. So I made my PhD uh, at, uh, at GANIL about the formation and excitation of hot nuclei. Then I moved to uh, a CA center in, uh, close to Paris, uh, bruyere le Châtel, where I worked on the measurement of uh, neutron emission in inspiration reactions. And uh, I obtained a permanent position at this same center. And during uh, 15, 14 years, I worked on different topics uh, that uh, you can see here. And uh, for three years, I am now at, uh, at GANIL, and I am responsible of the Neutron for Science facility, uh, which will uh, start uh, next week at, uh, at GANIL. So I spoke about GANIL, but where is GANIL? Uh, GANIL is in Normandy. Oh, here you have a map of France. And Normandy is this region, and, and GANIL is here in Caen. It's more or less uh, 200 uh, kilometers the west of Paris. Uh, Normandy is uh, quite well-known country for some speciality based on apple, okay? You have cider, camembert, or calvados. We are also very well-known monument here at the Mont Saint-Michel, but we are also few nuclear power plants. Three of them are in Normandy. And here you have a map, a, a picture of the Fermont Valley site where will uh, be built, or where they try to build the UPR reactor, it's here. And we have also the uh, site of Areva, where uh, nuclear uh, fuels are reprocessed. Okay, and in addition, we have also the GANIL facility, which is a, a heavy ion uh, accelerator, which is on that part. And we are building here Spiral 2 facility, which is now, the building is now finished. It's a new, uh, new accelerator. Just a, a word about, about uh, GANIL. GANIL in that part, it's... Uh, an accelerator of large, uh, large accelerator of heavy ions, uh, up to 100 MeV per nucleon, and dedicated mainly to the study of uh, nuclear structure and uh, nuclear reactions. And the new accelerator, Spiral 2, is that part here, we, which will accelerate uh, proton and deuteron up to 40 MeV at a very high intensity. And we will have, for all concern, the neutron for science facility, which will be dedicated to the study of uh, neutron induced reaction with a large, uh, with a time of flight facility and a, a radiation facility. So uh, I stop for the introduction. I will now move to uh, the measurement of uh, daily neutrons. So here is an outline of my talk. I will start by, given, uh, by uh, giving some uh, definitions on, on characteristics of uh, the daily neutrons. Uh, a few words about the application where we use these daily neutrons, and uh, I will uh, focus on uh, the measurement technique of these uh, daily neutrons. And I will finish by giving a few examples of experiments which were performed dedicated to the measurement of, uh, of daily neutrons. So, uh, where daily neutrons uh, are uh, play a role, I put four, four, four uh, topics. Okay, the control of uh, nuclear uh, reactors, we will speak it uh, a little bit later. The interaction technique also, I will speak uh, also uh, later. But there are also interests in, uh, nuclear, uh, ast in uh, astrophysics, in the nuclear synthesis, because it uh, plays a role in the air process. And it's important to know this uh, uh, yield and characteristic of beta delay in order to be able to evaluate uh, the... Uh, the abundance of the different elements. And it's also can be used in a study of a nuclear structure in order also to understand uh, how the nuclei are uh, arranged. So first, uh, definition and characteristics. Uh, so the neutron, the daily neutron uh, usually are following a beta decay. Okay, Here you have a, a, an excited nuclei which decay by beta, uh, beta process. And <coughs> If the Q value of the beta is greater than the uh, uh, one neutron separation energy, it can, after beta emission, emit some one or two neutrons. So, and it means that uh, <coughs> if you have a rich nuclei, okay, you can emit 
uh, beta and then be followed by neutrons and also by, uh, by photons. So this nuclei, we call it a precursor, and there are a lot of precursors, more than 300 precursors exist, which decay by beta, beta n uh, delay. So the important parameter are the pn, that's the probability that uh, uh, nuclei emit uh, neutrons, and uh, the time distribution of these daily neutrons follow, of course, the half-life of the precursor. So uh, here you have a chart of uh, the nuclei. Here is a Z and the number of, uh, of neutrons of C. And here you have a, a PN, the neutr daily neutron probability uh, as a function of this, uh, this nuclei. Here in black, you have a stable uh, nuclei. So you see that the rich nuclei, which are, which are in this part, have a great probability to, uh, to emit a beta delay. So, uh, if you read about these uh, different neutrons, uh, when you have a fission induced by a neutron or induced by a photon, it doesn't matter. Uh, the compound nuclei uh, split in mainly in two, two heavy fragments. Each of one is excited and it tries to de-excite first by emitting some neutrons. In that case, we, we, spoke about, uh, we speak about uh, fast neutrons. And because this emission is quite, uh, quite fast, huh? you see the, the, the time range, uh, 10 to the minus 10 to the 18 uh, seconds. And then the fission fragment continue to de-excite because some of them, most of them are uh, radioactive and they de-excite by emitting gamma rays or gamma rays on, the, on neutrons. So, and uh, these, uh, these neutrons are called daily neutrons because it happens between milliseconds and several seconds, uh, uh, up to one minute, uh, because of the, the half-life of, uh, of this nuclei. So, an order of magnitude, the number of prompt neutrons, usually we exprime it compared to the fission. So, prompt neutrons is between, let's say, two and four proton, uh, neutrons per fission. Okay, it depends on the energy of the neutron, it depends on the actinide, but more or less it's this, uh, this, this uh, order of magnitude. The daily neutrons, it's 0.125 daily neutrons per 100 fission. So it's, let's, let's, it's, a, it's a very few compared to the prompt neutrons. So and we also define the beta uh, parameter, which is a fraction of daily neutrons over the number of uh, prompt neutrons. So uh, you say that I spoke about fission. So to illustrate that, if you look at the fission products, the fission fragment produce, in a neutron-induced fission, in, and the same chart as, uh, as I saw previously, you can say that most of the nuclei produced are neutron-rich uh, nuclei, and they will have a, grand ch a large chance to decay by beta n, uh, beta n decay. So that's why the beta n decay is uh, very important in the, in, in the fission process. So another characteristic, so I said to you that uh, the daily neutrons are emitted by precursor, this precursor have a half-life, so the, the lifetime, uh, and with a lifetime between milliseconds and uh, minutes, so the time characteristic of the daily neutron will follow these lifetimes. So the daily deal we already speak about. So, and as there are a large number of precursors, we can't treat it all of them individually, so we, have, uh, we merge it in some groups. So, and we define some, some groups have been defined, and this group uh, have defined corresponding to the half-life. So, uh, we will see that uh, later. So, concerning the energy range of, uh, of this daily neutron, here you have a, a scheme of the energy spectrum of uh, daily neutrons in this one compared to the prompt neutrons. Okay, prompt neutrons have an average energy of uh, uh, around 2 MeV, uh, and the most probable energy around 700 keV, and uh, daily neutrons are an energy le bit, uh, below 1.5 MeV. That, uh, this energy spectrum is softer than the, than the prompt one. <coughs> so, concerning also uh, the, the value, the number of prompt neutrons or the value of daily neutrons, you can see here it depends strongly of uh, the actinide and also of the, of the energy of the in incident neutrons, depending if you have fast neutrons or thermal neutrons, for example. <coughs> so, concerning this uh, time distribution, uh, we usually uh, merge in several groups depending on the half-life. 
usually we use six groups, but depending on the library, some, sometimes we use five groups or eight groups, it depends. So how can you characterize your uh, daily neutrons uh, emission? By the yield, of course, it's the number of daily neutrons per fission, but also by the time distribution. So, and if you use uh, a number of uh, six groups, for example, you can uh, put your daily, daily time distribution as a sum of six exponent, dick exponential, as you can see here. Here you have an illustration that the daily neutrons measure, and here you have the six group contribution of each of the six group. So it means that with six groups, you need 12 parameters. You have six AE and six uh, period or lambda E to characterize the groups. So in this definition, uh, the sum of the AE is equal to the nu D. Nu D is the number of daily neutron per fission. Okay. Sometimes you can find some definition where you have nu D here and you have uh, AE is a ratio and the sum of the AE is equal to one. It depends on... Uh, how you want to, to use this. So here you have an example uh, of uh, daily neutrons uh, contribution. It's in uh, plutonium-9 and uranium-8. Plutonium-9 here and uranium-8. And you have here the number of groups. So the first group is a group of longest halfway. Okay, and the sixth is uh, the one of uh, shorter. So you see the shorter, 200 milliseconds. The longest, 55 uh, microseconds. Uh, sorry. So, and you see that in this kind of, uh, the number of daily neutrons in this case is 1.6%, okay? In the case, and here you have the, the, the half-life related to, to, to this group here. So, so here you have the relative ad abundances, uh, and here this number, the absolute group, in fact, this number is a m multiplication of this relative abundances by the daily neutron number, and you have here the absolute yield of each of the groups. Okay, now uh, as an application. So we can use uh, daily neutrons in the active interaction techniques. So what is uh, the goal of this kind of activation technique? So the first, one of the first is the safeguard. So okay, you have a suspicion about uh, a package. So it can be, you want to see, uh, to, to see if you have not a nuclear weapon or more probably a traffic of nuclear materials or a dirty bomb. So you, you want to, to, to know if there are an actinide in your package. So. So uh, you can also use it to monitor the fuel processing because uh, when you process uh, fuel, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, actinide and also daily neutrons. And also to manage waste, okay? Sometimes uh, uh, you have some uh, concrete blocks and you don't know what is inside because uh, it is here for a long time. And, so, and maybe it's more interesting to have an active, uh, detect an active detection than to be able to make a chemical uh, test, for example. So, so now, uh, usually, how do we proceed for an interrogation? So we start by a passive detection. So you have, for example, here, it's a, a truck. So uh, a passive detection shows, OK, there is a suspicious because you detect some gammas. So you make a radiography in order to, to see where you have an, an, an element of high density which is quite, uh, quite fast. And then you can make an active uh, interrogation because thanks to the radiography, you know where you have to look. Okay. And the active interrogation, so uh, you use uh, uh, pulse radiation. It could be neutrons or photons. Okay. And you're, uh, you're, you are looking of, uh, on a, of a daily, daily, uh, daily neutrons. So... It means first step, the package you're irradiated by neutrons or by photons. You have, during this phase, you have the emission of prompt neutrons or also prompt fission, okay? The detection is difficult because uh, you have a, a large background induced by the beam you use. Okay, it's difficult to, to, to detect the, the prompt, uh, the prompt uh, gamma ray or neutron, neutrons. Then you stop the radiation and you detect the, the presence of neutrons or photons delayed, okay, because you have stopped your radiation. And uh, uh, if you have daily neutrons, you very probably have uh, actinide. So, and if you can measure the yield and the tide dependence, maybe you can uh, have an indication of the mass of actinide and also to have an identification of, uh, of the anhydride present in there. So, 
in most of the technique now, they use both uh, delete photon and delete neutrons in order to have more information uh, on uh, the actinide you have in, in your package. So here you have a schematic view. Uh, in this case, uh, it was an electron accelerator which was used to produce uh, photo, photo fission. So, and in order to, to be able to, to design such a, such a facility, you need to simulate all the setup because you have the uh, absorption of, in this case, of photon or impinging neutrons inside your, uh, your barrel. And you have also to simulate uh, the absorption of daily neutrons or daily photons from the actinide and to, until the, the detection system. So, and for that, you need a, a, a simulation. And for this simulation, you need really relevant data and especially the characteristic of the daily neutrons especially if you want to, to be able to identify your, your actinide. So, con second application concerning the control of, uh, of uh, fission reactors. So, as you know, fission reactor works with a, a chain reaction. Uh, for each uh, fission, you have uh, several neutrons are emitted, protons or delete, or, and delete neutrons, and each of the, uh, some of these neutrons produce another uh, reaction, which is uh, the, the, the chain reactions. So uh, we define the, 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 the Kf, which is a number of neutrons which really induce another fission. Okay. So and to work correctly, the coefficient should be equal to one. Okay. Below one, your uh, reactor uh, shut down. Above one, uh, you have a great problem. So uh, here, another uh, thing about uh, two, two the two kinds of actinide used in, uh, in the reactor. For U5, you, you see you have 2.3 uh, prompt neutrons and 1.6% of daily neutrons. And you compare to plutonium, you have more prompt neutrons and less daily neutrons than uranium. So you will see the consequence uh, just after. So we define the neutron time generation. So the neutron time generation, this uh, lambda, it's the time be between the birth of two fission. Okay fission neutrons in, in use in successive uh, generation. So if you look at the population of uh, neutrons in, in your reactor at a time t, uh, this one, and you, you, see, you look at uh, the, the number of neutrons at time t plus lambda, okay, it's, uh, it has been increased by a factor of k effective. So you can make this uh, small uh, mathematical uh, transformation. And you have here the evolution of the number of neutrons as a function of the number of neutrons at t equals zero, and the time, the k effective, the multiplication factor, and uh, the neutron generation time. Okay? So, if you want, in fast reactor, the uh, time generation is around one microsecond. You have to take into account the emission of neutrons, uh, the neutron induced fission, and some, some slowing down. In time reactors, the uh, average prompt is, uh, is larger because uh, you have a slowing down of neutrons inside the, in, in the water. Okay, that's due to the prompt neutrons. Okay, now if you look at do, what is due to the daily neutrons for this uh, uranium five uh, neutron induced reaction, the average daily neutron is uh, 12, 12 seconds. It's much larger than this one or this twenty five microseconds. So now, if you want to calculate the total average of this uh, of this time. You have to take into account the uh, average time of prompt multiplied by the number of prompt neutrons and the average uh, daily neutron multiplied by the number of daily neutrons. So, so uh, and okay, in always the case of uranium 5, okay, you have a beta, beta of uh, 0.65%. It's a number of daily neutrons, the ratio of daily neutrons. So if you calculate the uh, average time by the formula just, just before, you have an average of uh, uh, 81 milliseconds. Okay? Now, if you take the hypothesis of a KF of uh, 1.301, which is very close to 1, but uh, not 1. Okay? Now, if we add only prompt neutrons, okay? I remind you the average time was 25 microseconds. And now, if you calculate the uh, uh, increase of neutrons in one second, and n, n zero is the number of neutrons at t equals zero, and n at t equals one second, the number of neutrons one second later. So, you uh, apply the formula, you apply this formula, okay, and you obtain 
an increase by a factor 55. So in this case, it's completely impossible to control your reactor such an amount in one second. Now, if you take into account the average time delay, we just calculate uh, here. Here we have no more 25 microseconds, but we are uh, 0.1 uh, 80 uh, milliseconds, and in that case, you use the same, uh, the same formula, and here the increase is only on 1 over 1,000. So in that case, you can control your actor. So just to say that without daily neutrons, we won't be able to control a nuclear reactor. Okay, that's uh, one of the main uh, applications of daily neutrons. So it means that uh, you know to need this kind of uh, of value in order to make your estimation of your daily of your reactors. So another uh, other things that uh, I already show you some difference between uranium five and plutonium nine. Okay, because the number of daily neutrons depend on the actinide and also on the energy. So here you have why? Because here you have the fission uh, fission uh, fission fragment uh, yield distribution. Okay, in use in a fission of uranium-8 and in curium-249. Uh, you, you see that the distribution are clearly not the same. And as you saw at the beginning, the daily neutrons are emitted by the excited fission fragment. So if your fission fragment distribution is the same, your neutron, daily neutron distribution won't be the same. Okay. And here you can see, uh, for different actinide of increasing masses, you have here neutrons, the number of neutrons emitted, it in increases with the mass of the actinide, but the daily neutrons is decreases with the mass. So it means that if we still want to measure, uh, to, to, to calculate our average generation time, okay, it will decrease when the, the actinide uh, mass will uh, increase. So it means that in your reactor, fast reactor, or when your reactor uh, have more and more plutonium or other uh, transactinide nuclei, okay, uh, the beta will decrease and your reactor will become more and more nervous. Okay. And it has to be taken into account, especially in the new, uh, in the new reactor. So now I will switch to the measurement of, uh, of daily neutrons. So at neutrons, to measure it, we need detector, of course. So it will be very short because now you know everything about detector, I'm sure you uh, you know everything uh, after the lecture of Ralph. So liquid scintillator, okay, I won't speak about more. It's fast, fast detector, an efficiency around 10 to 50 percent, depending on uh, on the size of your uh, of your thing. But it's fast detector. You can make time of flight measurements. So uh, I will speak a little bit more time about the. The LM3 gas detector, so you, it looks like that. Huh? Here you have a, a tube with a, a field beef, uh, with LM3, or it could be BF3, but now uh, BF3 is uh, become dangerous. Uh, we use uh, LM3. Uh, it's a gas detector with a high voltage, and you, you have, a, you have a, a signal when you have a charged particle inside. So the detection, you use uh, this reaction, the NP reaction on LM3 detector, on LM3 uh, nuclei, sorry. And here you have uh, the, um, the pulse high spectra you can measure at the exit. Okay. Here it corresponds, uh, okay, the Q value is uh, 0.7 uh, MeV. Uh, if you have uh, thermal neutrons making a reaction, you have here, you, you have the total energy, the Q value. In that case, you have the two peaks here correspond to all effects. It means uh, the, when the case of the proton or the triton has been stopped in the wall and uh, didn't uh, deposit all his, uh, its energy in the gas. So the uh, efficiency of this kind of detector depends strongly on the uh, cross-section of this reaction, of course, and this cross-section is, uh, is here. So, okay, we can't say very, very well, but here around 1 MeV, you have a cross-section below 1 bound. And around thermal MeV, Thermal, uh, thermal uh, energy range, you have uh, 5,000 uh, pounds. Okay. So it means that uh, we will need to increase the detection efficiency because with one bound, it's very few. <coughs> How we do that? So uh, the best way, 
is to slow down the neutrons. If you have neutrons of 1 MeV and you can slow down to the thermal energy, you can strongly increase uh, your detection efficiency. So to do that, we, we, we place the helium-3 tube inside the polyethylene uh, matrix because polyethylene is uh, uh, very rich in, in hydrogen. So in order to increase the detection efficiency, you can also increase the number of tubes, of course. Okay. And if you can, to use a four-pi geometry. If you can recover all your targets by uh, this kind of detector, you increase the geometrical, the geometrical efficiency. But the consequence of that, that is that you have a slow detector because the slowing down process takes time. Okay, it takes several microseconds or, or more. So it means that you can't um, anymore uh, use this detector to measure the energy by time of light techniques. But, but uh, this, this uh, time, uh, time decay is uh, still fast uh, in comparison to the uh, time uh, or, uh, the, the delay, uh, in comparison to the half-life of the, of the fission fragment uh, of the group one, of the group six, for example. So, but as you can't de determine the uh, uh, energy of your neutrons, you can't, uh, in that case, take into account correctly the efficiency. So, what we do in this case, we design the detector. In, in, in fact, we design the thickness of uh, polyethylene in order to try to have a quite constant efficiency as a function of the energy. The energy range is quite limited. It, it's below 1.5 MeV, huh, the daily neutrons uh, energy. So, and you can choose your thickness uh, uh, around your uh, LM3 detector in order to have a quite constant efficiency. So as an example, you have a thick neutron detector. It's a Belen detector where you have the beta daily neutron detector. In fact, it's a, uh, an assembly of uh, LM3 detector in a different crones, here you have two, two crones, yeah, in a matrix of, uh, of polyethylene. So here you make your reaction here, where you have your daily neutrons are emitted from the, the center, and the neutrons are slowed down in the, in the polyethylene and detected by this crone. And here you have uh, uh, the calculation of the efficient detection efficiency as a function of energy. Here you have uh, 10 keV, here 1 MeV, 2 MeV, okay? And here you have the contribution of the first crown in red, okay? And the contribution of the second crown here. And if you make the sum of these two crowns, you see that you succeed to have a quite flat efficiency in the energy range of beta, of beta delay, of uh, delay neutrons, okay? And you can see that you have a, a, a neutron efficiency uh, around 30%. It's a total efficiency. Huh? It's, a, it's not the intrinsic efficiency, the total efficiency, which is quite high for, uh, for neutron detection. So you, have, uh, you can also uh, increase efficiency if you increase the number of uh, helium-3 tube on also the size of your polythene. Here you have an example of the Bricken uh, detector. Uh, here they, they have... Um, Use a lot of uh, helium-3 detector coming from different. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Why? Yes, but in, in, in this case, you don't have a neutron beam. No, in this case, you don't have a neutron beam. I will show you later. It's used. It's used with a, a beta detector to start the measurement. Uh, with a neutron beam, I understand. But in this case, in this case, uh, not so sure. Uh, okay, uh, that's okay. So you see that uh, you can increase uh, strongly the efficiency. Up in, in this case, it's sixty percent. So uh, in, in this kind of experiment, we will see later. It's uh, particularly particularly important to have a high efficiency because they want to detect very rare events. Okay. Now this one I know better. This one there is some canyon. Okay, <laughs> because uh, I, I build it myself. Uh, and it was to be used in a neutron 
uh, field or in photon field also. Okay, but it's the same principle. We have 12 helium-3 tubes with a matrix of uh, of CH2, and we have cadmium outside also inside. Okay, but in that in that case, we have to avoid the diffusion of neutrons in the in the area uh, to to them. So and, uh, again, uh, as you saw in the previous transparency, we have managed the thickness of this uh, of this uh, tube in order to have quite constant efficiency as a function of the energy of uh, the daily neutrons. But you see, in that case, we have only 12 percent efficiency. It's much lower than in the case of the two previous detectors I show you. Okay. So. Uh, for the measurement, uh, I've skipped in two, two parts. Uh, the one I, I call microscopic measurement, and then the one I call macroscopic measurement. So, what I call microscopic measurement, it, in that case, you have your fission fragment, you have your uh, rich nuclei, neutron rich nuclei, and uh, you detect the beta emission in correlation with a neutron. So, <coughs> so uh, to do that, you need to identify your precursor. You can do it by spectrometry, gamma spectrometry. If you put a gamma, uh, gamma detector close to, to your uh, uh, close to your sample, or by mass spectrometry, I will show you uh, an example. So here, if your detector uses a fast detector and you have a, a fly path, you can deduce because you have a start signal by detection of your beta. Okay, you can measure the energy of your neutron, of your daily neutron in that case. Okay. So you can have this kind of detector, uh, a time of flight spectrometer. Huh? You have your uh, fragment, your neutron rich nuclei emit neutrons here, and you have a uh, neutron detector at a certain distance in order to be able to measure the energy. Or you can use the kind of detector I just mentioned before, a four pi neutron detector. Okay, you, you send your uh, nuclei in the center, you have a beta uh, detectors, and you detect the, the neutron emitted in coincidence with the beta. So, for example, uh, here it was an experiment performed at, uh, at GSI in, in Germany. So, they produce a large amount of, uh, of, uh, of fragments by using this reaction. Uh, uh, you have eight uh, beam fragmented on a barium target, then you send in a spectrometer, so FRS spectrometer, which allow you to identify a lot of, uh, of uh, nuclei. Here you can have this identification of, of the different uh, nuclei and also of the, of the isotopes. So, and for each time you implant one detector in your uh, silicon detector, for example, you detect a beta, and in coincidence, you are looking the neutrons you are uh, emitting. So, and by that way, you can measure the, the daily neutrons, the probability of each of these uh, of these nuclei. So, okay, time of flight technique. You know everything about that, of course. Uh, you understood very well that the important uh, parameter are the, the time resolution and the fly path. So, for the time resolution, I already mentioned, you need a fast detector. You can't use a detector with a CH2, okay? And for the fly path, okay, you have to put your detector as far as possible. But in this case, you decrease strongly the geometrical efficiency. So you have to, to make a compromise between, uh, between these, uh, these two things. Uh, the advantage is as you measure the energy, you can correct from the efficiency of your detector because the efficiency depends on, on your energy. The drawback is, uh, in the case you use several uh, detectors, you have to correct from uh, the crosstalk because sometimes you detect one neutron in a detector, but you don't know if it comes from, the, from your target or it has been scattered in a detector, neighboring, a neighboring detector. So. And in addition, uh, I didn't mention before, but you need a, a detector not sensitive to gamma ray or a detector we, with, uh, which allow you to discriminate neutrons for gamma, because uh, fission products they also emit a lot of, of gamma ray. So the solution is a liquid scintillator like uh, Na213, or you can also use a plastic scintillator. So here you have an example of a detector using plastic scintillator. Uh, on, the, on the left hand side, it was a toner detector, which is uh, no more used. It was, uh, it was used at uh, 
Uh, at Ganil, it was used at CERN also. So you have some, uh, some plastic scintillator on, on that way. You have two phototubes at uh, each part of the scintillator. When uh, you detect an event here, you have the difference of time between this phototube and this one allow you to, lo to, to make a localization of your detector. Uh, you see it's a geometrical like a, a barrel. Uh, in the center, you have the, your, uh, your point of emission, where you, have the, you detect the beta decay. And you, by time of flight, you can measure the energy of the neutrons from here to here. Okay. Uh, in that case, you have an efficiency of, uh, you have a, an uh, angular coverage of uh, half of uh, 4 pi and uh, an intrinsic efficiency of 30% at 2 MeV. But the energy resolution qui was quite poor, uh, not better than 10%. Okay, here you have another uh, kind of uh, such a detector. It is a Vandal detector. In that case, it's also plastic scintillator, but uh, the, uh, the detector has a long and flat, uh, flat part. But uh, the advantage of this detector is that you can arrange this uh, set, of this array of uh, detectors in a different uh, geometry uh, as you want. So now you have uh, this kind of detector, now spectrometer also, but with uh, liquid scintillator, uh, as I mentioned before. Here you have the skin of the, of the monster detector, which uh, uh, is, uh, it still exists, but uh, all the detectors are not yet available. And the number of detectors is increasing uh, with, with the time. So uh, that's detector based on liquid scintillator. And here you have the, the the, the parameters and what is expected. So the goal is to have a quite good uh, uh, energy resolution measurement and also to have a quite high efficiency in order to be able to measure beta n decay, but also beta 2 n decay. So if you want to have the event with two neutrons, so it becomes more difficult to, 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 to have them. Okay, here you have the, uh, the expected uh, geometric efficiency and the, on, on the energy resolution. So uh, this kind of detector will be used at, uh, at different facilities, at DESIR, at CERN, uh, okay, especially for the study uh, of nuclear structure or for astrophysical uh, studies. So I will now go to this uh, other kind of experiment, what I, I call mi microscopic uh, measurements. So in that case, we don't detect the beta delay. Okay? we will uh, irradiate a sick sample and detect the emitted daily neutrons. So for that, what do we need? Uh, we need to know the fission rate, okay? <coughs> and this fission rate can be calculated uh, from the flux and the mass of the samples, if you know the cross-section, okay? Or you can measure it if you have a detector, fission, fission chamber, for example, uh, with the same, uh, the same actinine or the one you want to, to study. You need to, to have a, a, pulse, uh, a beam cutoff which is fast because you want to make irradiation then to cut the beam and to detect the daily, uh, daily neutrons. So fast, it means faster than the shorter half-life. Uh, it means the group, the group 6 which have a half-life of, uh, of uh, 200 milliseconds. And also, you need a high, high efficiency detector, not sensitive to photons, of course. Uh, and as I mentioned before, we'll use a 4 pi neutron detector, uh, and if possible, with an energy uh, not depending of the energy, uh, with an efficiency not depending of the, of the neutron energy. So, you have a sample of mass m, okay? You radiate it in a flux of neutrons, phi. Okay, you can calculate the fission rate by this, uh, uh, by this formula. Huh? If you, you, you need to know the flux on your fission cross-section, okay, you calculate the, the rate. So you will irradiate during a certain time Tr, and then you will detect daily neutrons uh, during that period. So now if you look at a group E, the daily neutron uh, rate of this group is uh, during the radiation is given by this formula, okay, the fission rate, uh, multiplied by the uh, abundance, the number of daily neutrons of group E, and this period to take into account uh, the, 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 this, uh, this behavior of the curve. Okay. Then, when you stop the radiation during the decay, okay, the yield, neutron yield you measure here, 
is equal to, to this part. It means that this part is the number of, uh, of neutrons you have at the end of your radiation, and here is just the decay uh, of your neutrons. Okay? And for all of the group, okay, you make a sum uh, of this part on all your six groups, for example. So now there are two strategies uh, depending on the time of the irradiation you made. If you use a very long irradiation time compared to the group, the group uh, one, okay, group one is 55 seconds. Here. Okay, always the same things, it's okay. And now, okay, you detect the number of neutrons, I call it Fn, the number of neutrons uh, you detect with an efficiency uh, epsilon. So the yield of neutrons is uh, this one, the one you detect corrected by the efficiency. Okay, if you have this uh, relationship, okay, this uh, value is more or less equal to one, okay, and it simplifies the equation we had before, that's uh, this one, okay. At this one, this equation become, become this one, okay. You have the time distribution as a function of the fission rate and the parameter of your, uh, your group E, okay. And if you take at t equal zero, this becomes this. At t equal zero, you have just the fission rate multiplied by the uh, number of uh, daily neutrons, okay. So that's the value we want to know is this one, the number of daily neutrons. It's just obtained by measuring your number of uh, neutrons at t equal zero. At the end of your radiation, you measure the number of neutrons. You have Fn. From Fn, you can deduce uh, this, this value. Okay? Now, if you use a very short irradiation time this time, okay? Always the same uh, counting rate, or the, same, the same picture, always the same formula, same relations. But in that case, if the T radiation is very short, this relation becomes this one. And the first uh, relationship we had, okay, during the decay of neutron, becomes this one. And you replace this by, uh, you replace this part by this one, and you obtain this relationship. Now, if you integrate this part from t equal zero up to infinite, but uh, up to the end of the decay, you integrate this zone, okay? Uh, this relationship becomes this one. Okay, I remind you that the number of fission during the experiment is the fission rate multiplied by the duration of irradiation. This integral is equal to one, and so you obtain this value that the reintegration here is equal to the number of fission multiplied by the value you are looking for. It's the, uh, the sum of the AE, which is a new T. Okay? So in that case, you have to measure the integration of these things. Okay. So which method will you use? It will depend on the flux you have, and so you have to make your estimation to see if you have to use this one or the one uh, I just presented you before. So uh, here you have, the, uh, again, the time distribution of, uh, of, of our neutrons with the contribution of the six groups, as you can see here, okay? The shorter group are here, of course, and, uh, and the longest one is, uh, uh, oh, I think there is something uh, wrong in, because the red one is a, is a sum, okay? Oh. okay. So uh, what you see is that if now, just previously, I just show you how to determine the new D, the number of daily neutrons. Now we want to determine the uh, different parameters. You see that uh, if you want to determine all these parameters, you will need to have uh, irradiation time adapted to the group you want to measure. Okay. So if you want to measure these groups, okay, you will need to perform if you want accurate measurement, you will need to perform different irradiation of different time of irradiation and time of, uh, of decay, okay? For example, if you want to measure the long half-life groups, you will use long irradiation times, okay, also called infinite irradiation times, and you will measure the neutrons for long times, okay? Here, if you make irradiation time for uh, five minutes and um, decay measurement during five minutes, you will mainly populate this part of, of, uh, of the neutrons. You will mainly populate the group uh, one and two. 
Okay? Now, if you, put, if you do very short irradiation, in a very short irradiation, your half-life of long duration won't be populated. So in that case, you will uh, optimize the uh, population of the short half-life. And then you can put a third type of irradiation with an intermediate time uh, irradiation, let's say 10 seconds or 20 seconds. In that case, you can determine the uh, group uh, 3 and 4. Okay? If you make only one kind of irradiation times, you, you can't succeed to have all the, all the group very accurately. So if you can make so different irradiation times, you can choose which kind of group you will populate mainly. So now uh, I will give you some examples of uh, experiments which uh, take into account uh, what I, uh, I sh already said, said to you. So one was performed recently uh, at CERN. It was, uh, the goal was to study the beta decay of uh, lithium-8, uh, lithium-11 uh, nuclei. Okay? Uh, this nuclei was uh, produced uh, at CERN is old. Okay? And uh, you use uh, such kind of uh, spectrometer. Uh, it is composed of uh, several neutron detectors. One, uh, some of them are from uh, Monster, some of them co come from the Eden detector from uh, IPN, some of them were, were coming from, uh, from CEA. So here you have the characteristic of the different, uh, of, the, of the detector with the energy resolution, the, the time, uh, the, the fly path, uh, and also you cover, you see, you cover very small part of the solid angle. Here you have a picture of uh, what it looks like. Uh, here at the center you, you have the detector of uh, beta, uh, beta detector. You have in addition a gamma, uh, a gamma detector in order to, to make some identification uh, of, of, the, uh, of the lithium, uh, lithium haven. Okay. And here you can see the different uh, detectors. Uh, they are not no, mo always five centimeters thick. It's important because it, take, it, it, it play a role in the energy revolution because you have, uh, here you have an uncertainty on your fly path because of thickness of the detector. Okay? So uh, I can't show you any result because uh, the experiment was performed recently. That's to illustrate this kind of, of uh, experiment what I, uh, I, I call microscopic uh, measurement. So and also one, one of the problem is to to be able to take into account the crosstalk of event, because if you detect an event here, are you sure that a neutron coming from here to here, or a neutron coming from here, which may scatter here and go to the other detector? That's uh, that's one of the problems of this kind of measurement. So uh, older measurement what was performed uh, in a reactor. So it was uh, performed at the Godiva uh, reactor in Los Alamos. Uh, in, in that case, you radiate uh, samples uh, in a reactor, and after radiation, you remove your samples here by a pneumatic system to a quantic station. Okay? In that case, uh, neutrons were detected by a uh, detector based of a BF3 detector. Uh, the samples were between 2 and 5 grams, okay? and uh, we have a very intense uh, pulse. 10 to the 16 fission by, by pulse. It's a quite huge uh, number of neutrons were uh, emitted here. Okay, uh, the number of fission was uh, deduced from uh, the measurement of the activities of uh, the molybden 99, which is one of the well-known fission fragments of, uh, of the fission. Okay, uh, you can find reference. You see it's a quite old measurement. Huh? Uh, okay, you can find other measurements performed in the reactor. Uh, the advantage is that you have a very high flux. So it means if you have a high flux, you can use it with a small sample. But the drawback is, OK, you have not a really uh, short time cut that the same that you can have with an accelerator. OK, maybe it will be, it will be difficult to determine uh, the, the parameter of the group uh, five or six with the shorter groups. Okay. Your detection setup has to be placed quite far away from your reactor because uh, this detector will see the daily neutron, but it will see also the neutron from the, from the reactor. And also, also the problem is if a reactor, you, okay, you have access to only two kinds of spectra, a thermal one or the spectra of fast neutron if you use a reactor uh, where neutrons are not, uh, not slowed down. 
So here you have a, a part of the, of the results uh, obtained by, uh, by keeping. In fact, you have three, three scales. Uh, okay? uh, the one is, is this short time, okay, correspond to this. The B is, is this, the time scale here, correspond to this curve, and the one is corresponding to this one. So, and uh, with uh, thanks this uh, kind of uh, time distribution, he, he succeeded to extract some uh, contribution of the different groups, of the six groups here. So, I said to you that it was difficult, it was impossible to change the energy uh, in reactor. We have more, more or less two kind of spectra. So we can uh, try to make this kind of measurement with an accelerator uh, where you can choose the energy range. Okay, here it's an experiment uh, we have performed at uh, PTB with Ralph. Uh, with Piaf, uh, it's a PTB ion accelerator facility, I think so. And PTB is a physical issue, technical bundes and... Okay. <laughs> Ask to Ralph. <laughs> okay. Uh, this detector I showed you just before, it's a CH2 detector with a 12 helium troop with cadmium inside and outside. Okay. Neutrons are produced by, uh, by, the, by reaction. Uh, we use a DD reaction and, uh, and a P, PT reaction also, and DT, uh, DT reaction also. Okay. The neutron source is, is there, okay. the production target where neutrons are produced, but they are produced in 4 pi, huh, as uh, now you know that uh, very well. Uh, and our samples were placed inside the detector. The det well, you don't see, but the detector, it's a holy detector, there's a hole inside, okay. and the samples were placed in the center. Okay. We have used the fission, daily neutron of the fission induced on thorium uh, 232. And we also have uh, studied the fission of uh, neptunium 237. So we use uh, the beam of the accelerator. Uh, OK, the goal was to, to measure the daily de neutron yield, not the time distribution. Okay. And uh, we use pulse beam. It means that we use a, a neutron, neutron beam. We radiate the sample during five minutes in order to be at, uh, <coughs> at the equilib equilibrium. Okay, all the, all the, uh, we have the nuclear equilibrium. And then we, we make some cycle uh, when, during which we, we shut off the, the beam during one second. And here, here is the, uh, the number of count on our detector. And that part is when the beam is on. Okay, the detector see a lot of neutrons, huh? the neutrons coming from the source, from everywhere. And when we shut down the beam, okay, here we have only the daily neutrons which are, which are detected during the, during the decay. Okay, you, you can have from here, you can go there, and with that, you can determine your number of neutrons emitted at t equals zero. Okay, and when we use the formula I show you, uh, I show you before with this strategy of irradiation, with, when you put a long irradiation and a, a short time. Okay, uh, so what is the problem of this kind of measurement? Uh, as you see, the, uh, the neutrons here are emitted in 4 pi. So some of them go to the samples, but some of other, they are scattered around in the, in, in the area, but also they are scattered in the, in the detector. So, and we have to take into account, huh, because it is an open source. Also, we use a sick target, because to obtain a reasonable uh, counting rate, we can't use a very thin target. We use, in that case, uh, 180 gram of thorium. So, SIG target, it means that inside the target, you can have slowing down, you have kind of scattering, and uh, multiple reactions. So, you have to take that into account. And you also, we have to make a correction because our irradiation time was not uh, infinite. Okay, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have some cycles, and you have a small correction to, to, to perform to that. So here you have uh, a simulation performed with uh, MCNPX of the number of fission in the samples, okay? Here it was as a function of the energy of the neutron which produced the fission, okay? And in that case, we use a, a monokinetic neutron of 4 MeV. So here you have two, two parts with the detector or with the detector. With a simulation, it's very easy to remove the detector or not. And what you look, it's yeah, many of the fission are produced at 4 MeV, which is a direct neutron uh, emission, which uh, direct neutron energy we have produced. 
But there are also fission induced at lower energy. It's due to neutrons which are slowed down in the samples, and also neutrons which have been uh, or slowed down in the sample for this one. And for this one here, when uh, the detector is taking into account, that's the contribution of neutrons which are scattered in the detector and go back to the sample. Okay? So we have to take into account of that part. But we have also neutrons, produ uh, fission produced at energy higher than the incident neutron beam. So how can you explain that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's just because we make a large amount of fission. And when you make fission, you produce neutron fission. And this neutron fission have an energy going up to more than 10 MeV. And this neutron fission can induce a secondary fission. That's why we can produce fission at energy, at neutron energy, higher than the neutron energy of, of the beam. Okay. So now, Odelin neutron. But Odelin neutrons, they come from all the fission. Okay. So they come from the monokinetic mono part, from the fission coming from here. That's the one we want to measure. But we have also daily neutron coming from this part, which we call up, up part here. And we have also neutrons coming from the down part. Down part, that's the neutrons we are coming here. So our daily neutrons are all this contribution. So, and if we want our neutron, daily neutrons yield in the monokinetic part, we have to take into account all these contributions. Okay, so it means that we have some corrections to do. So. Now, in order to minimize the correction, we have to place the samples at a good, good position. If you are closer to the source, you can minimize the backscattering of neutrons from your detector to the samples. But it has to, to, be, the, to be simulated uh, before. And then we uh, succeed to obtain the daily, yield, uh, the daily neutron yield uh, for different energy from 2 MeV up to 16 MeV, and these three points were completely new, uh, were not existing before. And here we have the value which were in the evaluated databases, so and it seems that the databases was not too, too wrong. Okay. So, another uh, kind of experiment, now we switch to the photofission, okay? That's experiment we have performed at, uh, at CEA, and in that case, we wanted to measure the daily neutron yield, but also the time distribution in, a, in a fission induced by photons, okay? On different uh, isotopes, different actinides, we perform uh, uranium-8, uranium-5, plutonium-9, uh, neptunium-7, thorium-232, okay? So in a brem strahlung uh, we use uh, an electron accelerator, uh, the electrons are hitting a tantalum converter. In that case, you produce prime shallow spectrum, like you have a, a, a picture here. If you use 15 uh, MeV electrons, you produce gamma up to 15 MeV. Okay? So we have behind a collimator, behind this converter, in order to have uh, photon beams and our same detector as previously on our uh, sample inside. Here, the advantage that we have a collimated beam. So in that case, that uh, no photons uh, are supposed to, to eat the detector and to be uh, scattered to, to the sample. So here you have a picture of, uh, of the setup and uh, the exit of the collimator. Uh, in addition, we have put also a photon detector, a BGO, to, to try to measure the uh, delayed photons at the same time. Okay, and the target was placed in, in the center of, of that. Okay, and uh, again, we make a, a repetitive cycle of irradiation and counting, as you can see here, and also a, okay, always the same in order to determine these two parameters for each group. And if you have this parameter for each group, you can deduce the new D, which is the sum of this, uh, of this I. Okay, here you have some uh, results we have obtained. Uh, that's the relative contribution of, uh, of the different group, group uh, one, group two, group uh, four, three, and up to six. And uh, we have performed this measurement at uh, different energy. And here, uh, no, I don't know where are your results. Uh, I don't remember. No, the results are the, uh, I don't remember. So, 
So that what, what we look, uh, it has been performed at different uh, different energy, incident energy of the of the Bram Shalom, and uh, we see that there are some differences in some groups. Uh, mostly in the uh, uh, short half lives there are differences depending on the on the energy. So the energy of photons uh, influence the relative abundance of the of the plant group. So and we find some differences with uh, a previous measurement uh, of uh, of this guy, uh, and mainly we we think that uh, we found these differences because we perform these three kind of uh, irradiation time. So short irradiation, medium irradiation, long irradiation, that he, he can't do it. So. Uh, another kind of uh, experiment, that's uh, daily neutron measure in spallation reactions. Okay. So spallation reaction, I remind you, it's uh, high energy proton or deuterium or lm three or uh, light nuclei usually, uh, which it's a target, and it makes a cascade inside the nuclei, and it can produce a lot of particles, but many neutrons, but also protons, but many neutrons. And if you use this kind of reaction in a sick target, the neutrons you have emitted in your nuclear reaction can induce other reaction and other and other. So it means that thanks to a sick target on high energy beam, you can produce a lot, a lot of neutrons. But if you produce a lot of neutrons, you will also produce a lot of fission, okay? But uh, by the neutrons, okay? Or also by the, your uh, primary uh, beam of proton, for example. So, here we use, uh, the, this experiment was performed at, uh, at Gatchina in, in, in Russia. Uh, we use a 1 GV proton beam hitting a lead target. And here we have placed a neutron detector, helium, helium 3 uh, detector. And we, we send the beam, we cut off, and we detect the daily neutrons. And here you have a, an example of uh, the kind of spectra we've measured. So we measured uh, bromide, uh, we, we measured neutrons that we attribute to bromide thanks to the half-life, so that's fission products. But you see that we can also see light nuclei which decay by uh, beta by uh, daily neutron emission, like here lithium-9 or, uh, or uh, nitrogen-17. So a picture of uh, the target. When I say seek target, it's a seek target. Okay. Uh, okay. So here's the, the exit of the beam. At 1 GV, you can do it uh, in the air. It's no problem. And here it was a neutron detector. So, and uh, we have measured this uh, production of this element as a function of the thickness of the, of the target. You perform several experiments with, uh, you remove small parts of, of this target, and you can uh, estimate the, the yield of your, 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 your different fragments, and then you compare to, uh, to calculation with a different uh, nuclear cascade. Nuclear codes. So another measurement concerning uh, spallation, uh, spallation reaction. It was performed at that time at uh, PSI in, in, in Switzerland with the mega mega pi target. So okay, mega pi, mega pi. It was a liquid target of uh, lead bismuth heated by uh, uh, high energy protons at uh, 590 MeV. Uh, I assume, so in order to produce a large amount of neutrons for different uh, applications. So uh, the, the target is a liquid metal target. Why liquid? Because uh, you, can, uh, you, you can't destroy the, wh when you use a solid target with the energy deposition, you can destroy your, your, your target. So with a liquid target, you can evacuate the heating deposition. And in fact, it's a loop, and uh, this, uh, this, this uh, this liquid is in, inside a loop and it, uh, it moves uh, around. Okay. And uh, what's the problem with uh, daily neutrons? That as you have a loop of liquid, even if you produce your reaction here, if your liquid go on that direction with daily neutrons, neutrons emitted several seconds be, be, uh, uh, after the reaction, they will be emitted in the other part than in the core of the reactor. So, and it can be a problem because it, it displays the neutron dose you produce, okay? So, and so again, we perform some experiments. Uh, here is a scheme of the, of the loop. We have placed an LM3 detector uh, on the top, and we have measured the neutrons uh, also. You will see the same nuclei that we saw at Gatchina. 
but we could estimate the neutron dose produced uh, quite far from the core of the, of the reactor. So, and it was not negligible because uh, uh, the rate of uh, neutrons was, uh, was not so uh, insignificant. So uh, it, it, it is important because it, it means that maybe you have to, to, take some, uh, to take some precaution quite far off the core of the reactor. So uh, now I'm finished. Uh, to summarize my presentation, so I give you uh, uh, four topics where daily neutrons uh, play a role. So I'm concentrate on the control of reactor on the activation technique. And uh, for macroscopic measurement, <coughs> sorry, we can uh, measure the proton, uh, the probability of emission, and also the energy uh, of uh, these daily neutrons on macroscopic. That uh, when we detect incontinence, the beta. Uh, the beta uh, and the neutrons. And in microscopic uh, measurements, in that case, we irradiate a secret target. And in this case, we just detect neutrons and we try to detect the neutron yields on the time distribution in order to be able to determine the parameters of the, of the different group. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you.